Okay, okay. Welcome everyone. This is so weird. It really feels like I'm talking to myself. Um, so welcome to this Republic of Work uh, wellness series. Um, Angie from Republic of Work is over the road on the South Mall. I'm in my office in Lavitz Key and Republic of Work are putting on um, these wellness talks and you can access them um, at their website. And so it's everything to do with keeping your you know, mind and body healthy if you're in a startup or starting a business. But also there's a lot of information and talks about like financial stuff and, um, and other areas <laughs> that, that are all listed on the website too. So I'm going to start into my talk straight away. And um, I am definitely aiming to leave time for questions. But I've also kind of like uh, really jam packed it because there's loads of stuff that I'd like to share with you today and that I think is really important. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. And so the first, oh my goodness, is this going to flick over? It is. Okay. So that is me in the corner there, super cheesy photo outside my office. Um, and so about me personally, so I started dieting when I was 12 years old and I was a binge eater for many years and um, I was three stone heavier at one point. Uh, I was very fixated on, um, I was very fixated on, oh, sorry, I was just trying to put off, a minute. sorry. Um, uh, on my weight and good food and bad food and all of that. And then I thought getting a degree in nutrition and dietetics, like I thought if you wanted to sort out your weight, that would be a very good place to start. And I would say that didn't help me at all. And so my mindset was definitely the problem. I was very negative about foods and I was very negative about my body. So I was always find what was the bad thing in food and why food was bad for you and the foods to avoid and be scared of. And with my body as well, probably like so many people, I was always just finding the faults. Um, and then professionally, I've been a registered dietitian for 12 years. I'm completing a master's in nutritional medicine at the moment. And I requalified in a lot of areas to do with like coaching, neurolinguistic programming, hypnotherapy and mindset, because that's actually all the stuff that worked for me personally. And now that's all the stuff that I work with uh, when I'm working with patients. So. Um, so then to preface, I think there's two types of people in uh, when it comes to food. So there's the type of people that the end justifies the means. And so I've worked with a lot of personal trainers over the years, and um, they are genuinely dead happy to just eat stuff like beans or boiled eggs or, you know, whatever the hell they need to eat in order to keep them ripped. And they really think that food is just fuel and they're absolutely OK to follow rules. Um, and then there's the other kind of group of us that um, the joy is in the journey. And so we get a lot of pleasure from food and we maybe eat when we're, for, when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're lonely, um, for enjoyment, pleasure, everything. So um, our food and our pleasure is very important to us. So we don't do well with food rules and that can cause problems with our weight and our eating. So, um, so the good food, bad food theory has a lot to answer for because um, the, the, the first thing I just wanted to put my camera up there, but I can't. Um, so, so the first thing is, is that what we're made think is that there's good foods that you should eat. And then there's bad foods that we're definitely not meant to be eating. And this has actually got the opposite psychological effect on a lot of us. So the diet industry is saying, oh, be good and eat this. And I think really when life is hitting you hard, the last thing you're going to want to do is be good. So generally, if you've had a really hard day or really you know, hard week, you're certainly not going to be going for good foods. And then equally, the food industry says, go on, you deserve it. And the thing is, with both of these chats, whether you're saying like, oh, it's so, oh, you're being good if you choose that or have it because you deserve it. We don't do that with any other bodily functions. So if you were like, if, if you needed to put on a jumper, or you did put on a jumper, that's not you being good. And that's not like you deserve it. That's just kind of pretty logical that if you're uncomfortable, you do something to make you more comfortable. And like, so this is the whole thing. We've kind of forgot the basics of eating. The basics of eating is that when you're hungry, you eat something. And that food is to make you feel better. 
food is to add strength and pleasure and energy to your body. And if it's not doing that, you, you know, you don't need it or it's not time to eat. Um, so some of the examples again of how this hasn't really worked in our favor is um, also when people think of food as good, and this certainly would have been my problem, like um, we can continuously eat because it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. I had a good thing. Like it was an apple. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's fine. I, it was a diet yogurt. You're there good for you. And you're actually just continuing your food addiction because you're kind of like, oh, it's a good food. It's a good food. It's a good food. So I would have to say that a lot of the clients that I work with, it's not as if they're like, sitting in McDonald's all day, every day and drinking two, two liter bottles of Coke. It's like they're, um, you know, they're eating really, really good food. So the whole good food and weight thing has led a lot of us really um, astray. And then the other thing is, is that um, when we're, oh, I just, sorry, when we're, um, ah, this is so annoying, sorry. When, when you eat like popular, normal food foods, then we kind of feel guilty then we feel guilt, shame and regret. So it's like we're it's really coming at us from both angles. The diet industry is like, if you eat this, you should feel bad about yourself. And then the, the food industry is like, oh, go on. It'd be such a prize and such a pleasure. And I remember when I had a really hard job in London and I was really down on Friday nights, I kind of was like, oh, yeah, I'll get, you know, the M&S &S meal and I'll get wine. And it's like we're just being hypnotized that that's a reward. And so then on a Friday or Saturday night, we might be going to bed, bursting at the seams, you know, really full, really lethargic, starting off for Saturday morning, pretty like with a food hangover. And all because we've been told, oh, this is such a reward. This is what you do when you've had a hard day. So, um, so it's really a case as well where we have to start thinking about ourselves and what we need and what our body individually needs. So the good news is we need all foods. So there's no one food that could ever cause you a weight problem. There's no one food that could ever cause you a health problem either, unless you've got some clinical diagnosis from an actual, you know, GP or consultant like celiac disease. But otherwise, for the normal person who doesn't really have much wrong with them, we need all foods. And I think people don't realize this, but you know, when I'm a dietitian working in a hospital, the stuff that's keeping a lot people people alive is like butter and cream and cheese. And that's what you're doing most of spending most of your time doing is, you know, getting the kitchen to add more butter or cheese to the potatoes or giving an old lady a little shot of whiskey to boost her appetite or something. And you know, say if you had like GI problems or diarrhea or some kind of um, gastro infection, it's like fruit and veg would be the worst thing for you. So there is no good or bad food. It's, it's horses for courses. And from a nutrition point of view, it just kind of matters what you're low on. Um, and so all foods contain nutrients and all foods are important for our overall health. So like in, in health as well, we're also of course, including socially, emotionally, and physically. Um, and so humans, back to the basics, right? Um, humans can only get nutrients and energy um, from three macronutrients in food. So there is a fourth um, source of calories that would be alcohol, but we're, we don't really you know, get that in our food um, and it doesn't supply us with, with all the other stuff too. So carbohydrates, fat and protein. So carbohydrates is like the family term and included in that is sugar. And then fat is also something super, super vital for our body. And included in that is saturated and unsaturated fat. And protein is also something that the body cannot manufacture itself. So it has to get from food. And we get that from things like meat, fish, and eggs. So then you've got this culture that we've got going on now of where we've created a culture of fear around food and nutrients. So, you know, you just have to like, open Netflix and you can watch a whole load about movies of like the truth about sugar or the truth about meat and fish or the truth about fat and fat and it's like what's next it's like is it really in our best interest to turn yourselves against the only things that like you know were that are in our lives uh, every day these foods that are giving us health and energy and a lot of benefits so there's kind of no benefit in you turning yourself against sugar and there's kind of no benefit um, turning yourself ag against meat and fish. And I like, you know, obviously maybe if people have other stronger beliefs, fair enough, 
but if 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 you're actually okay to eat them and you like the, to eat them there's really no point um absorbing this fear from that kind of diet industry that they're very bad for your body or certainly going to make you fat and same goes for for um same goes for eating fat too um and so we cannot survive without these three nutrients so there's no real benefit in a finding the negatives in these nutrients but b finding the negatives in anything you eat because you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot so some great things about fat because i suppose the 90s dieting has really kind of we all have a bit of a hangover from low low fat diets in the 90s and obviously they were complete and utter rubbish um, but just to summarize, our brain is 60% fat. A fifth of the dehydrated weight of your brain is purely omega-3 fat, which we have to get from food and your body cannot make. Our gallbladder depends on needing 10 grams of fat minimum per day. A healthy body composition for a woman is a third fat. So we are, uh, there's a lot of fat in us as, as a woman. And fat is fat and estrogen are basically best friends in the body. So estrogen um, kind of talks to fat and tells it where, where to store. That's why women have fat on their hips and their boobs and their bum. And that's because it's a slow release energy place to store fat. Whereas men have fat on their stomach and that's better for going from like zero to, you know, 10 kilometers an hour if they're running after a deer. Whereas women have more fat in them for basically um, for, for, for nursing kids and getting pregnant and stuff like that. And so fat or sebum is what gives us glossier hair, softer skin. Um, and then, so both females and males, we cannot absorb fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K unless we are eating enough fat. And so it doesn't matter if you're eating or if you're taking all the supplements in the world, if you don't have enough fat in your diet, you're not gonna absorb those supplements. Um, and so vitamin A is what's really important for our eyesight and the normal functioning of our organs. Vitamin D, of course, is our immune system. Vitamin um, E is the anti-inflammatory, the anti-aging kind of vitamin. And vitamin K is what's needed to clot our blood and wound healing. Um, and I just have vitamin D and Irish people there again, because in Ireland, we don't get any vitamin D from the sun between September and March. So it's no major coincidence how we love our animal products, how we've always loved our, our cream and our butter and our cheese and our meat, because while our Mediterranean neighbors have all the sunshine they could ever need, we're not getting any vitamin D between September and March. So we really need these foods for the, both the fat and for the vitamin D. So, um, so they are some of the many, many positive benefits of eating fat and why fat is just such a kind thing to have in your diet, basically. Um, so uh, I'll just bring up the screen there again. Um, so, um, Okay, so what, what, oh, what did I do there? Right, so what bad foods, why bad foods do not cause weight gain? So I think this dawned on me early enough because, right, we all have a skinny friend that we grew up with and then maybe you still have a skinny friend or a slim friend that they're not really interested in dieting or nutrition at all. And what dawned on me early days is that what my slim friends do was nothing like what they were telling us to do in Weight Watchers. So like what the diet world tells you to do and what slim people actually do are totally different. And that's kind of mad because if you were starting a business and you wanted to be really successful, you'd be probably you know reading books by Richard Branson or Lewis Howes or someone like that. And you would be mimicking what they do on a daily basis. Whereas when we're wanting to be, well, for me, I wanted to be, I wanted to be able to say that I'm the kind of person who can eat whatever I want and not get fat. So that was the dream. And that is a very, very different persona than someone who's weighing their foods, getting on a scales every morning, hating their body, going on keto and doing all these crazy, crazy things. So just kind of a bit of a reality check. Um, that we need to do with ourselves sometimes I think when we're giving our heart, ourselves a hard time about our eating so it's like are you honestly saying that slim people don't eat takeaways chocolates and sweets are you honestly saying that you think slim people are not in McDonald's 
are you saying that slim people always portion size um, these foods? Um, and that, so really everyone who has a slim friend um, knows that it's, it's not about, it doesn't necessarily need to mean about cutting out those foods. So bad foods per se are not why someone has excess weight. And I definitely know that from my experience of being three stone heavier, I was doing all the things that you should do. I was eating all the good foods. So it's not bad foods are the problem. Um, so what we need to understand is that nutrition and weight loss are two very different topics. Nutrition and being nourished is about having a wide variety of nutrients in your diet, you know, keeping your body well. Weight is purely down to calorie intake. And somewhere along the line, those messages have been blurred. So somewhere along the line, we think nutrition has something to do with weight loss when it doesn't. So say, for instance, you know, like I've literally heard people saying like, oh, I was being good because I had sweet potato rather than normal potato. And it's kind of like, Ah, uh, yeah, but sweet potato is more antioxidants, but there's no significant difference in calories. Um, and so, so another example of that, I suppose, is that people are like, oh, geez, white bread is terrible for your weight. And actually brown bread and brown seeded bread has more calories than white bread. So with nutrition, it all just depends on what your body needs, because if you need more calcium, then white bread is a better option for you. If you need more fiber, yeah, brown bread is a better option for you. But yet again, they are a different kind of topic of conversation to weight loss. Um, and then, like I said, you know, we could be down on ourselves about um, eating cheese or butter or whatever. But depending on our nutritional needs, they will be very important. Um, so the thing is about when people are talking about these are the nourishing foods that you should eat in order to lose weight, the assumption is that you're very hungry. The assumption is, is that if you had a big salad, that you'd forget that chocolate exists, which, as we all know, is not the case. So nutritional advice for weight loss is all based around the fact that you're probably really hungry. So if you had loads of fibrous foods, then, you know, you'd stop, be hung you'd stop being hungry and you'd stop eating the junk, which is that's actually the opposite of what we need when we're overweight. Because, first of all, when we have issues with our weight and our eating, we're not eating because we're consistently hungry and we're certainly not eating things because we've never seen the food pyramid or we didn't know that fruit and veg was good for us. We're, we're eating out of emotional reasons. And so it's not hunger. And so the problem is with that is that if you're not hungry and if you keep stuffing in tasteless foods um, that you don't really like the taste of, the problem is um, you're already, if you weren't hungry, starting off at a point that your taste buds are not sensitive. So the, the further up our weight goes, the, the higher our weight goes, the further we go from our natural weight, the more our taste buds diminish. So we find it harder to get satisfaction from food. So you've, you, if, if you've ever had a weight problem, you'll know the thing where like you're hoping that this chocolate biscuit you're going to eat Will give you pleasure and enjoyment and you'll be able to stop but then you just want another one and another one because you're not getting that pleasure and enjoyment and part of the reason you're not getting that pleasure and enjoyment is because you don't have any hunger so then when nutritional advice comes along to say eat all this really really fibrous foods what you're actually doing is diminishing your taste buds even more so that nothing's nothing tastes nice now and then that's when I felt for me anyway, I was a bit of a junkie where it's kind of like maybe cheese and crackers would be nice. No, they're not. Maybe I'll have ice cream. No, that's not working. OK, maybe I'll have chocolate. No, that's not working. And we keep hunting for taste and pleasure, but it won't be there because we're not hungry. So. Um, so what this hunger scale is and how to use it. So first of all, um, why do we need the hunger scale? We need the hunger scale because now a lovely blowout celebratory meal uh, is probably the equivalent of two days worth of energy long ago. And God love them long ago. They didn't have delivery. They didn't have centers and super values with lovely, delicious foods. Um, you know, they had a lot more limited choices. And the average scene, I suppose, was people were eating locally grown, low calorie meals. They had manual labor and they probably were hungry for those meals. So 
skipping breakfast back in the day mightn't have been a good idea because you might have um, you might faint in the field or something. Whereas nowadays, if if we had a you know a big Chinese or something last night, it's pretty understandable enough that our body might be a bit busy then the the next day or hours later, still breaking down all that fuel and all those calories. So why do we need a hunger scale? So first of all. You are very, very good at listening to your body. You are excellent at it. So this is just a teeny tiny section um, of listening to your body that you maybe haven't been doing. So you know if you don't know whether you need to put on a jumper or not, it's probably because your, 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 your temperature is fine. And if you don't know whether you need to go to the loo or not, it's probably because you don't, you're fine. And so equally, if our stomach is feeling like a little bit indifferent, like as in, it's not really belly rumbling or anything. Um, well, then it probably is because it's happy out. It's, it's happy out with what you gave it before. It's still processing and working away on what you gave it yesterday or what you gave it earlier. So a good way of kind of thinking it is measuring, um, and maybe it'd be a good idea to kind of just think about this right now. So if, you're, if, if we're kind of thinking that 10 is full, and zero is hungry belly rumbling. Where are you right now? Um, so, so I think the thing is, is that um, it's, it's good to know about what all these different points mean. So first of all, um, I'll talk about the not full or not hungry because I think this is probably the most important. So when I was overweight or when I had food issues, I was kind of generally never hungry or never full. Um, so, so I couldn't even remember the last time I was hungry and, you know, me and my clients chat all the time about the advice they've got from people about like, oh my God, you know, you have to have a shake before your workout or you have to have a shake after it, or, you know, you can't get hungry because your, your muscle mass will decline or you have to have breakfast and all of these things. And it's kind of like three quarters of the population are overweight or obese. Like we're doing grand. Like if you're, if, if your stomach hasn't said it's hungry, it means it's not. So it's actually, um, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of terrible routine to get into, to feel not hungry and, and have your meal on top of that feeling. Because what I noticed for me anyways, was it was, um, it would really make you doubt yourself as well, even more and doubt your ability to lose weight because I'd be sitting down to dinner and I'd know I'm not that hungry at all at all. And then I'd end up eating all the dinner, having seconds and then snacking more that evening than I have all, all, all week or something. And then you'd be like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? I wasn't even hungry and I ate all of that. Um, and so this is where all the doubt comes in. But the thing is, it's kind of like spraying perfume every half an hour. If you keep spraying the same perfume, your brain isn't gonna be like, Aoife, that's a new perfume, you know? And equally, if you're just, if your status is always pretty full, you know, your, your brain is not going to alert you to this is fullness because it's, it's, it's the norm. So the thing is just like, we need, you know, um, we need nighttime to know it's morning time. We need sadness to know happiness. We're not going to be able to feel like full and satisfied and done. And that was delicious unless we're like hungry and empty and wanting. So it's like, you really need you really need hunger in order to have the taste and satisfaction and fullness after a meal. Um, then with uh, 10 being full, um, I suppose uh, it, it's, it's a good idea maybe to switch your thinking about this because usually when we have a weight problem, we have a very negative attitude about our body and we feel that our body has really, really left us down and has not been kind of sensitive to the changes we're trying to make over the years and all of that thing, all of, all of that side of things. However, if we start viewing things differently, like if you start listening to your stomach and you start becoming aware of every time it's full, what you see is that your stomach and your body is the real victim of the situation here. Because while your stomach was kind of saying, hey, will you hold your horses? I already have enough in there we might have kept eating because we were going to be good tomorrow or we were going to start walking tomorrow or we we're going to start some fitness thing or we were going to go off bread for a week after we just have this last bit of it or whatever and so it's that your stomach was shouting at you 
please stop here. I'm not capable of any more food. I don't want to put on any more weight. And we pushed past that feeling of full and kept eating for other kind of mental reasons. Um, then the other side of the scale is hunger, of course. And uh, really with hunger, um, if you're anxious about your, your weight and about eating and stuff, can be very, very, very hard to, to wait for hunger. Because at least on diets, you know, you can always be like, I had a diet yogurt, I had an apple, now I had some nuts, now I had some low fat muesli. And you can actually be continuously topping up, topping up, topping up. Whereas actually not taking an action is very hard. So it's worth seeing that in a different way as well. So as you're waiting for hunger, what you're allowing your body do is to clear the fat from um, your bloodstream from the last meal and to give it a chance to clear the sugar from your bloodstream from the last meal. So it needs that kind of processing time. The other thing is, is that your stomach is like a bag of acid. And if there's constantly food just like dribbling in, dribbling in, dribbling in the whole time, you're kind of affecting your stomach acidity there. Um, and so the food is less, or the food is less digested perhaps, or your capacity for digestion is reduced because your the, the, the acidity of your stomach has reduced. Um, then also we've got our digestive enzymes further down in our intestines, and they also need to be available and ready to go for the next food. So you see, if the system is constantly busy with the last food that's there, well then our digestive capacity is reduced. And it's super common that once we've hit an all time high with our weight, we start getting things like bloating and digestive issues that we, we, we never had before. And this is all evidence from your body saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not like designed for this level of eating. I just can't hack it, which is kind of funny when you think about it, because, um, you know, most of us are telling us my body's trying to make me fat, my body's against me, when in reality, your stomach has always been saying um, a very different story. Um, I don't think I've ever talked for this long uninterrupted. So I'm like, I wonder, Angie, do you think, um, is, is, is there any need to stop for questions right now or anything? Uh, it's up to yourself, Aoife. If anyone has any questions and they want to unmute themselves or pop them into the chat box, we can, we can do that or we can keep going and do the questions at the end. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, do you have a preference, Angie? Um, no, I don't, I don't really mind. Like if you're kind of in a flow, I'd say keep going and we can take them in the end. And if anyone in the meantime wants to pop any questions into the chat box, I can keep an eye on if there's something relevant to what you're talking about at the time, I can, um, I can interrupt and pop the question in for you. Cool. Okay. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So uh, then, oh, I've said all that. So 10 is full and your body does, does not have the capability to break down more food comfortably. So just kind of coming from the angle of like, okay, whatever about weight, I want to start taking care of my body because the more you start taking care of your body on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis, the more your body will look like a body that's taken care of. So that's the other kind of other way to look at um, changing our weight so that we're now listening and respecting when our stomach is full. And then all the other things that are written there about, you know, our taste buds are regaining their sensitivity the more hungry we get so hunger is the best sauce and getting our stomach acid ready for the next meal our digestive enzymes ready and letting our body clear the backlog of sugar and fat from the last meal too okay and so it's really important when you're waiting for hunger um, that you're not putting more control on it because to be honest okay if i was talking if i was talking about the extremes so when we've got an extreme weight problem, we have like intense fear about getting fatter. We've intense fear about the power of certain foods, like they're gonna make us fat overnight or something. Um, and we've zero trust, of course. And then what we're saying here is just like, just like, you know, you trust that your, your body will tell you when you need to go to the loo, that now you're gonna trust your body when it says that, oh, I'm hungry now, will you eat? And we're just going by that. And so what would be very important is I suppose the part B of trusting that system would also be trusting um, what you want to eat next. And like, I know probably all the alarm bells that are going off in your head 
when I'm saying all of this, because they probably were all the ones that went off in my head when I learned all this first too. So, you know, what I was thinking is like, oh, geez, you don't know me. You don't know how much chocolate and takeaway I can, I can pack back, you know? And, um, and really the thing is, is that what you're kind of also thinking about is what would make you comfortable. So the difference is now the underlying kind of intention is not about what you can get away with and what you've got permission for, which is what we're always thinking about when we're like dieting or binging or dieting or breaking the binge. Instead, this is about what do you need at the specific time? Like what would make your body feel good? So of course, chocolate and takeaways and cake and yummy things would be part of that. And also you do know how to do this because if you know what discomfort is, well, then you know what comfort is. So if you know the amount of cake or chocolate that would make you feel like full and sick or take away your appetite for the rest of the day or make you feel bloated, well, then you can start little by little figuring out the amount of food that would just make you lovely belly full. And it is quite tough work initially to trust yourself enough to be like, okay, I can eat whatever I want. Oh, because sorry, you probably can't see that. Um, so I can eat whatever I want as long as I'm hungry before it. And as long as I'm nicely full, but not uncomfortable when I stop, knowing that I can have more later. So when you're, if, if you are interested in, in trying this, you might be kind of thinking, gotta be so cool then. And then when I'm hungry, I'll want a chicken salad or I'll want like apples or, you know, I want like a celery juice or something like that. Um, and unfortunately, that's not what happens, especially if you've been restricted for years. So when I was starting to do this first, I had many different seasons. I had a season where I just ate Nutella every single time I got hungry. I got Nutella because I had to realize that at no stage were police going to come out of another room and stop me from eating Nutella. Like as in, there is unlimited amount of Nutella forever. And the, the only real good reason to stop would be is if it was making me uncomfortable. I also had a little um, renaissance with pastel donatas, if you know those uh, custard Portuguese tarts. I wanted a lot of them. And most embarrassingly, I really wanted Findus crispy pancakes. Um, you know, so, so it's not necessarily that you're going to be craving the right foods for you because yet again, we need to take a step back now on assuming we know what's good for our body, because especially if we have food or weight issues, clearly we don't know what's good for our body. Um, and it'd be let, better to be guided by what will feel nice in your stomach after you eat it. Um, so, so our distorted food culture. So basically there would not be any issues with food and there would not be any uh, weight problems with anyone if we were full blown mindful the whole time. So the first thing is, is that we're generally not mindful. What we've done is that there's always a diet around the corner. You know, this is the last thing and then I'm going to be good. And, you know, so what we've actually done is we've created a food scarcity. So whereas before our ancestors wired for survival, um, they would have overcome any food scarcity by overeating beforehand or afterwards. Nowadays, we are self-imposing food scarcity by every time that, you know, we're kind of saying, OK, I'm going to lose a kilo a week now for the next four weeks. Um, what your survival brain is hearing there. Sorry, I have my trusty calculator. I just want to work this out. So that's 2.2 um, pounds by 3,500 calories by four weeks. So you're saying, that's it. I'm going to lose a kilo a week for the next four weeks. Um, and that's starting on Monday. Well, part of your brain is doing the math that it's kind of like, is she saying 31,000 calories is about to go away? Because if she's saying 31,000 calories is about to go away, I better stock up now. So this is one of the reasons why dieting causes weight gain over the time. Because before a diet begins and after one finishes, we're, our survival instincts, so some of it is conscious, some of it is unconscious, we're absolutely trying to cancel out um, the, the shortage that happened. So all our wiring is still wired for anti-famine and you know anti-food shortage. So we don't really want to be thinking about our food like that because it's impossible to be mindful about the food that you're eating now if in the back of your head, you're telling yourself food is going to go away. 
So food and oxygen are the only two things that we really need, you know, on the most basic level for survival, because, you know, food originally is what contained all the water as well, too. So, you know, just like if I was about to, if I said to you that oxygen was about to be gone from the room, it wouldn't be your personality that would be like, <gasps> you know, taking loads of oxygen in. It would just be like, that would be the unconscious survival part of your brain. So equally, the more you threaten yourself that weight loss is coming, the harder it is to be mindful with your meals and the more you'll overeat. So we're going to have to get around um, getting healthier, or losing weight a different way, um, because it, it's more about feeling well on a daily basis, whilst knowing that we will always be coexisting with, you know, McDonald's and Cadbury's and, and all the rest of it. And you know, as powerful as you are, you're not going to be able to close down Cadbury's. They're going to be with you probably every day of your life. So there's no point, And it's so silly when we tell ourselves that there might be less food tomorrow than there is today, or there might be less food next week. All it does is have the opposite reaction on our behaviors. So example of when you are mindful, like I said, would you like to use the bathroom? Would you like to put on another jumper? So if a friend asks you those questions, so what I always say to my clients when they're in here starting off is I'm like, if you left this room now and you met your friend in Costa and if she was like, would you like to use the bathroom? You know, you'd be like, yes or no. Would that make my body more comfortable? Whereas if she was like, would you like to have a slice of cake? You'd be thinking, am I allowed a slice of cake? Am I being good today or am I being bad today? What am I going to do tomorrow? Will I go for that big walk? Am I signing up for that huge weight loss thing? Oh, well, then I can have the cake. And none of them are related to kind of basically the taste or the feeling of the cake. So, um, so two ways, like the mindful versus non-mindful. So non-mindful is I can eat this because I'll go for a walk later. I can eat this because I'm in a bad phase and the good phase will be starting soon. Whereas mindful would be like, yes, yum, I love this cake. It would taste delicious and it would feel lovely in my stomach. Um, or no, I don't want that cake. I don't, I can't be bothered driving home with like, you know, a really full belly or, you know, no, I don't want that cake because I've had it before and it's pretty dry, but actually it's just reminded me about those cakes that I do really like. So, um, maybe I'll get one of those later instead. Um, or yes, I love this cake, but my stomach currently isn't ready. So I might take this home with me and wait till my stomach is ready. And then I'll have both the stomach feels that I want and taste buds at their maximum capacity. Um, so you would be just rating the food in terms of kind of how it's going to benefit or not benefit your body. Um, and I always kind of say a good measure is maybe in the next 20 minutes. So if you can imagine yourself kind of like, ah, God, why did I eat that in 20 minutes? Basically, why bother? It will be there later again. Um, so so naturally slim people are very good at that, by the way, as in they will only eat something if it tastes really good and if it feels really good in their stomach. And if it doesn't, they won't. And that's the end of it. So basically, we really need to get out of our mind when it comes to eating, because if depending on, you know, if you've if you've had issues with food or, you know, issues with weight or anything like that your mind basically can't be trusted because if we've any weight issues at all or any issues with food, it's because we're basically disgustingly negative in that department. So, you know, no matter what you eat this week, you'll find a problem with it. You know, it's always, you eat too much, you exercise too little, you're not doing good enough, you should be losing more weight, blah, 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 blah. So your mind and your thoughts can't be trusted for the moment. So now your measure of how well you're doing in terms of taking care of your body is the physical evidence. So if your, if your stomach doesn't have a problem with what you just ate, if it felt, feels like lovely belly full, well then your mind has no right and no evidence to say that you ate a bad food or you ate too much because your body is the expert on your body, not your logical mind. Um, so trusting your instincts. So if you're dreading fish for dinner, but salivating over having a burger, well then perhaps you're low in iron and or B12. So as in those instincts are there, you know, to guide you um, to, to your nutritional needs. So another example I have there 
is I am guessing you don't find coal appealing and you have no kind of intention or interest in licking a piece of coal. However, if you were a pregnant woman with an iron deficiency, that would seem very appetizing. So food actually always stays the same, but how it tastes to us depends on our needs. And you definitely would have had this before where you ate something one time and it was the most amazing thing you ever ate. And you ate it another time and it was just meh. It was just nothing to write home about. And that was basically that your body really, really, really didn't need it at that time. So another thing to think about there is uh, we can be really going through the motions of our day. We can just be having the breakfast we always have, having the lunch we always have, having the dinner we always have. And there's no food enjoyment. And then whenever we're doing that, chances are we're, we're picking and snacking more. We need more treats at the weekend because actually every meal counts. Every meal, your body and your brain is depending on getting a little hit of dopamine and serotonin, serotonin and rewards for eating. So the 20 minute rule, like I said, is about waiting, like trying to jump into your mind or your body and kind of say, if I ate this in 20 minutes time, would I be more comfortable or less comfortable? So doing that is the opposite of what dieters do, which is black and white thinking, where it's like, cake is always bad, salad is always good. And it's like, in real life, it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a lot different to that. Um, and like I said, nutritionally as well, your body needs different things every day. Um, and so you're, you're trusting yourself based on how you're going to feel in 20 minutes time. Keep in mind as well, if you're, if you are keen on starting this approach, there's a lot of trial and error. You know, it really is the case of the best sailors learn on the roughest seas. Like sometimes you learn what your body definitely, definitely does not like by the feeling in your stomach after a, a wrong food or too much food. So we varying needs. So another big problem like I was saying, especially because of the whole good food, bad food theory, is we can be wildly judgmental of foods, like super judgmental um, and judgmental of ourselves for eating them. So the thing is, it's kind of none of your business if, if you're on your period and your body needs more magnesium and therefore you're craving chocolate, you know? Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's not your job to kind of like overanalyze why your body needs what it needs. It's just your body it's just your job to listen to what your body needs in order to try and make your body feel as comfortable as good as possible at any given time and so making memories and a taste experience so like I said the kind of the non-mindfulness causing problems is when people are like eating a food and they're like oh my god I shouldn't be eating this how fat is this making me Jesus they're fat in this is there gluten in it is there dairy in it oh my god and like you know and, and just like all this like what what have I eaten so far and what's the future going to be like will I lose weight will this stop me losing weight and mindfulness would be the polar opposite mindfulness would be that you are full in the experience right now so you were tasting the food, you were like looking at all the colors, you are experiencing it as much as you can. You're very aware of the taste, you're very aware of how it's gradually filling up your stomach and how it's maybe making your stomach feel nice. And then you're maybe aware at the point at which it's going from feeling nice to feeling a bit too full. And, um, and also hopefully you've picked something that's really, really delicious. And so that it is a very rewarding experience that counts for a lot in your day. Um, where's my little, um, so how you know you're on track. So how you know you're on track is you start saying things like, no, I don't want it. I'm looking forward to being really hungry. So the pasta carbonara later will taste gorgeous. Or you say things like, oh my God, that was so worth waiting for. Or you say things like, that was so delicious. I'm still thinking about it hours and days later. And like I said, you can't really have any of those things without using the two main things, which is having hunger, like basically having your digestive capacity on your side, having all your taste buds fully online by being hungry. And then also by picking something that's definitely delicious to you. So they are the two, um, they, are, they are kind of the two main things that we're always thinking about. Um, so 
So yeah, so I think I'm, I'm pretty much the end and I really rabbited on um, and I really, really probably hit a huge word count. So um, thanks to everyone who kept listening there the whole time. God bless your um, patience and attention span. Um, but I would love if you have any questions at all, like any, hit me, hard ones, 